afternoon. Thanks for sticking around long enough. Um, I uh, am here to talk about a particular use case, but a little bit more than that. And the work I've been doing in the last couple of years has been um, <coughs> uh, in the world of the information ecosystem, and in particular, the polluted part of it. Uh, recently, someone asked me what I, what I was working on. I said, misinformation. And he said, oh, on which side? <laughs> somebody who had a deep skepticism, which I think is really valid um, about everything that we see in the world that we have to sort it out and we have to do it a whole lot better. And journalists are a key constituency in making this better. I hope that they will do it, but not just through better journalism, some other things. I want to make the case that and annotation as a tool for transparency is a fabulous tool, but I want to give a little bit of background and also uh, point out that people actually think that there's value in transparency. They're more willing to pay for stuff. Journalists didn't realize that until some surveys came out. But part of it is journalism's traditions and norms, which are pretty arrogant and top-down and always have been, at least until recently, and this notion that uh, these are things you'll hear from journalists when you ask them about their work often. Uh, my favorite, least favorite, is our work speaks for itself. <laughs> uh, well, no, I don't think that it really does. <laughs> and what do we do about uh, convincing journalists to change their ways. Well, projects we're working on are, are actually helping, and I'll get to that in a minute. I got to make the uh, reminder that misinformation is not new, uh, that we've been dealing with it for a long time, and that what is new is this coalescing of technology, uh, malign intent, and scale, and a whole bunch of things that were not the case before, and that it's, it spans a great variety of kinds of misinformation. I beg you here never to ever use the expression fake news. Uh, it's, uh, it's wrong in every possible way. Uh, two in particular, one is that by definition it's wrong. And second is that people who lie all the time have taken it over to describe things they don't like that are often true. So please don't use that. And if you followed this field at all, you know that it's going to get worse. The, the so-called deep fake phenomenon of having people saying things they didn't say, it's going to be a problem. And what the work that I've been doing for a while now involves uh, not just thinking about how we upgrade journalism and information, but how we upgrade ourselves on the demand side of information. The supply-demand equation requires us to have understanding on the demand side, and we don't have a lot of that at the moment. One of the ways to get there is through what people call media and news literacy. Uh, my colleagues and I have come to favor an expression that came from the American Press Institute, uh, news fluency, literacy having a kind of uh, negative connotation for people outside of the ac academy. So we think of it that way. But it's really a combination. It's a whole bunch of literacies that we have to help people get better at. And this is uh, increasingly a holistic situation. For journalists, one way to do this, to help their communities be more news fluent, news literate, and to give them more tools to combat the misinformation that's just pouring over them all the time, to understand better what's real, what's not. By the way, I'll make a, a copy of this available for everybody. Uh, is, the, is transparency. And there's evidence that it works. and. What is it? It's these things that I've listed here and, and others. Lots of things that involve techniques and practices that have not been part of the norm for journalism. One of our 
uh, project partners is the McClatchy company, which has 30 newsrooms around the country. And we've been working on a bunch of experiments with, we think, some pretty great success and uh, trying to make it go further. And one example of the transparency is having the journalists explain how they did the journalism. Uh, and this was a case where a reporter in Kansas City did something he had never done in his life, which is to explain in a podcast and the story on a wonderful series he did. And it cha it's changing the culture, and we think that's a wonderful thing. And I've not yet gotten people to think of annotation as part of that, except in some senses they're already doing it. And I'll give you some examples. In this case, uh, this is another McClatchy newsroom in uh, uh, Idaho. The Idaho Statesman did a long and involved and really quite good story on childcare in the community. And McClatchy has built into their content management system this thing they call it the, the um, I, for, I forgot the title they've given it, but it's a, it's a transparency plugin. They can answer questions about the journalism and they can move it anywhere they want in the story and they have deep metrics associated with this so they're figuring out what people will actually look at and thinking about using that in other ways. This is an annotation method. It's not the kind that Hypothesis does particularly, but it's really a breakthrough. No, another, no other news organization I'm aware of is doing this and they're moving ahead on this project uh, pretty quickly. Other news organizations have done transparency and annotation in other interesting ways. This is actually pretty old from the New York Times. Uh, basically, they link from the footnote to, or the number one to their response to that point in a letter to, uh, to the editor after a scathing piece they did on a local congressman. And I would have liked to see that conversation go further, let him respond to that or his staff and see where it goes. But it was a good thing to do. Lots of things to use this for in journalism, uh, including, you know, like, like you want to select out a really astonishing fact and say, well, here's why this is true. Usually there's attribution, but not always. The context, the, you know, going deeper on things, the invitation for the audience, the readers, the listeners, the viewers to come back to the journalists with better information. Because uh, one of my personal cliches when I was a journalist was that my re readers knew more than I did. And this was not like a, you know, any kind of breakthrough concept. It was just obvious. They had to. And it was a great advantage for me. The transparency is not the only use of annotation that I can think of. And there's some uh, really fun examples that people are doing. This is from Josh Marshall, uh, who writes Talking Points Memo, a political, well, he started as a blog. It's now a really robust uh, media company. And he takes uh, an Apple pen on, I forget the software, on his iPad and marks stuff up. This, in this case, uh, Josh, who is a scholar before he was a journalist, uh, is doing kind of the college professor markup, uh, saying, no, God, this is terrible stuff, and it should embarrass the people who did it. This is my personal favorite. When the Republican House, after not long after the Trump election, uh, passed a repeal of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Uh, a bunch of middle-aged white men got together with Trump on the White House lawn to celebrate their passage of something that would destroy the Affordable Care Act. And Josh goes in and he goes, gets the data and says, okay, here's how many people in each of their districts is going to lose health insurance. This is brilliant. Surfacing the data, its journalistic value is enormous and it's in, in a weird way entertaining. And there's no reason journalism has to be dry. This is great stuff and more people should imitate it. Hypothesis works with climate feedback on interesting ways of, of understanding bad journalism. Boy, there's a lot of bad science journalism out there. Uh, and we, 
one of our other projects is involved in that. There's another kind of annotation that's embedding metadata for transparency in the CMS, in the data, in it's, uh, the trust project. It's a fairly complicated process, but we strongly believe that this is a good idea and that organizations that do this are going to have a real advantage by demonstrating that they are deserving of more trust than not. No one deserves complete trust, but we different people deserve more than others. Another annotation form that I love in journalism is the cryon on cable news, which I otherwise don't like uh, because it's just people yelling at each other and uh, generally in stupid ways. But this is actually quite valuable to say, no, he didn't say that. This is another one. Uh, you notice I'm pointing to people who like to use the expression that, that I won't use. Uh, and th these, th there's value in this. It's sort of instant corrections. I think it's a mistake, by the way, to put people who lie on television in the first place. <laughs> I would ban anyone who's a known serial liar from my programs. That would be my policy. Yeah. The administration. <laughs> uh, it would, you'd, you'd find people who want to defend the president but who don't lie. It may be difficult, but it's worth trying. So I, I, that's, that would be, you know, if I become czar of journalism, that's going to be one of the rules. You don't give loudspeakers to liars. I've given you examples of things that are kind of read-write, or more so than not, and I uh, read-only. I think that read-write is where we ought to go with it, though it's hard. And an example um, that I just posted uh, on, uh, what disappeared? <coughs> open the sidebar. Okay. So th these are things that I don't know if you can see them. They're, they're not very uh, prominent here. But I added things that I think would be journalistically valuable to what I did. Uh, the, the first one is uh, it basically says, you know, you know uh, why am I doing this? It's because I believe in freedom of expression. Okay, that should give you context for why I'm writing this. And then... Uh, you know, some other things that are context, including uh, down below where I say, here's what they could do, the platform companies, to help on uh, fixing misinformation. And I've made a few, a list of a few of them, you know, no, you know not much progress, uh, you know, mixed at best and zero. Um, and then added one, which I would love to see more often, which is maybe you have other things that you'd like to see them do. And why don't we thrash that through or just email me, whichever. This is, I, I think, annotation like this in journalism would be highly useful, recognizing that journalists, A, are in a business that is crumbling financially and have no time. Uh, so everything we ask them to do, they say, well, what do you, what do you want me to not do? That's, that's a problem. But I think it's worth asking. And I think that the results are worth having. I want to ask all of you for some help in the annotation community. And this comes from a conversation with John Udell, who knows more about this than anybody I know. And he, he has suggested, and I, I truly love this idea of an evidence layer that would live in the journalism, but that would be interoperable with other people's journalism. So we're all pointing to the same source material and talking about that and we don't have to constantly reinvent wheels, that building this into content management and to journalism would be astonishing and be a, such a service to journalism. And of course, the key thing is it's got to be easy. Don't, we can't burden journalists with stuff. Journalists are not technical for the most part. But it would be great to have this evidence layer, and I, I'm excited by the idea. Uh, I think it's obvious, but I'll say it anyway, this is not just for journalists. Any organization in the world at this point that wants to be trusted 
it has to think about ways to do it because everyone's under attack at some level. Companies, not just politicians, not just journalists, and we maybe transparency is one of the ways, I believe it is, that they can add to trust from the rest of them. So that's a quick look through some ideas. I'm, I really get, came here to listen more than talk, and um, annotation is one of those things that has absolutely dazzled me from the minute I saw it. Um, even that horrible thing that lived on the web back in the 1990s the, uh, that pissed off absolutely everybody. Um, Third voice. Third voice, yes. <laughs> and, but the, ha, when I saw it, I thought, God, this is, this is a really interesting idea. They didn't do it right, but uh, I think you're all doing important work, and, and uh, thanks for helping me learn something, because I've learned a lot. Any questions or comments for Dan? Um, so this is not related to my day job, like everything else I've talked about here, but, um, but politics and news media is kind of a hobby of mine, so I try to stay on top of it. So this is fascinating to me. Um, in terms of uh, the evidence layer that you were talking about, um, how do you, how would you foresee that not getting um, skewed in any particular direction uh, and staying kind of pure evidence? Because if it's, you know, being you know, curated by the general public, it's easy for those kinds of things to go off track. So how, I mean, would there be some sort of regulatory something? Yeah. Or how would, how would that even work in your imagination? Uh, um, I, if I understand the basics of it, and I think John's better equipped to answer your question, but I think this would be done by the journalists at many different organizations. And it would, that you'd get into all kinds of fraught territory with who actually gets to be there. Is this a club of the, you know, all the usual suspects, or do we invite people who are not the traditional journalists? And I would go for the latter, but there's a governance issue, uh, but it, I think it's well worth the exploration and the work to do it right. So uh, you could bring in, you know, historians, other scholars, people who are, I think domain experts would be among the best participants because journalists don't tend to be domain experts. So I think there's rich opportunity for, for getting that to be at least useful and maybe crucial. Hi, yes, I found this really interesting, especially um, your comment about how there's a lot of bad science journalism out there. As someone who works at a science organization, I feel like it's a really hard balance because you want science to get out into the general public and you want to get it out the right way. Mm -hmm. That's really difficult. Um, this is a little bit more of a comment, but at AAAS we have this initiative called SciLines. The idea is that mm -hmm. you're direct yeah. that you are connecting journalists with scientists, mm -hmm. and so that, as you said, an evidence layer almost being like an expert layer yeah. so that different experts could lay, uh, could mm -hmm. you know lay additional levels of information on there i know you know when i was working in student journalism at least i would have a uh, i would interview a professor and then i would say what i think the professor said in an article and then the professor might email me and say hey you didn't quite get that right and then I might have to issue a correction or something like that that probably would never necessarily be seen or wouldn't, it was taken out of context, it was mm -hmm. hard to understand. So I think the idea of an expert layer would be maybe a way to do that as well, yeah. not just so yeah. journalists can comment because as you said, time is limited and that sort of thing. But Yeah, when I, when I was complaining about science journalism, I wasn't complaining as much about people who specialize in science as the fact that most science journalism is done by people who don't know much about science. <laughs> and one thing I would beg science journalists to do would be to pick this 
mantle up of helping their audiences understand how to read a piece of science journalism. That that's part of their job, I believe. Now, I've not made any headway in doing that. We, we are working on another project that I mentioned to you. Is a, we don't think news literacy, news fluency should be a subject by itself, though it is. We think it should be embedded into topic areas, and the first place we're working on that is science and health, where in the case of health, being misinformed you know, can hurt you in a really serious way, as we're seeing with this new outbreak of uh, measles. So we, we, we have to work on these things together. But the, again, the, I think there's no, totally nothing wrong with asking somebody who knows, well, did I get this right? When I was a columnist on technology, I used to call up people and say, I'm reading you a section uh, that's a little technical. Tell me if I'm right. It wasn't like I'm going to read you your quotes and you you know, edit me. I'm saying, tell me if I've got this right. And not invariably, but often enough to be important. And any time any number over one or over zero is enough to be important, they would say, well, you're, you're close. And how about this? That's journalism. That's not anything be except that. So I would encourage that too. And I'd encourage non-specialists to do that a lot. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Dan. Thanks for that. Um, do you think that, um, so I wanted to kind of get your take on the difference between um, uh, ad-supported media and subscription media um, or public media um, with respect to um, how they re report science news. Do you think that the there's different incentives to maybe um, be more sensational in the different categories? And what can we do about that? Uh, yeah, I can't do anything about uh, financial motives twisting uh, the output. I, I accept, try to persuade people that that's a terrible idea uh, if, if it's going to matter. But, you know, we all see this every day. To, you know, yesterday, coffee is really bad for you. Today, it's actually going to save your life. Tomorrow, uh, it's somewhere in the middle. And then, to, you know, a day, two days after that, coffee plus chocolate will save your life. I mean, it's... Forget wine. Well, wine, I, you know, I, that one, I have confirmation bias on that one. I'm, red wine is good for me. That's the end of this discussion. Uh, but... <laughs> Take it from me. Uh, I don't think it's this audience-driven, engagement-driven media uh, will tend to be more sensational. And we keep in mind that tabloids have been far more successful financially since they've existed and uh, th than, you know, serious journalism. Uh, and it was probably worse a century ago when Hearst got us into a war uh, with lies. Uh, you know, so far, that hasn't happened now. Um, I think we have to ask everybody who's doing it to care more about um, the mission that they allegedly are in. But a lot of people creating media, they're in the mission purely to stir things up, make money, or both. And I can't do anything about them except to point out when they do it. So it, this is, again, why I'm a proponent of the demand side being worked on at least as hard as trying to convince journalists and people uh, doing quasi-journalism to, to be responsible. I think we have to be re more responsible. Yeah. Hey, Dan. Um, I just wanted to, to echo what you said about how the solution has to be easy uh, in this in the climate of journalism as it, as it exists now. And uh, so I wanted to make a pitch to you know people out there who are coders, programmers, data architects, visionaries, design architects, whatever, that uh, we need help 
with our content management systems and so on. And if we can make annotation or inputting data as part of the workflow, it make it make it actually a way to that, so that collecting that data in an organized fashion actually helps us <laughs> and saves us time in the long run. Um, and that there's easy, painless ways to have it flow through. This is you know something I learned from John Udell. Um, that that's gonna that's how it's gonna work. You can't ask people to do the extra work, like you said. But if you know if the system could keep track of what websites I use while researching a story, and you know, or I could very easily keyword stuff, and uh, and then I could very easily see it at the end, and 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 or it could recognize phrases that I picked up from where and so on, and then mm -hmm. and it, that that that's going to happen at some point. It's just will it happen, you know, in, in five years, will it happen in 50? But I hope five. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, like many people in the room, was very interested in the idea of the evidence layer. And um, so my question was just more to learn a little bit about, more about how you see that. Is that kind of like, a canon for journalism that we kind of have these different categories and as an example let's say that we collectively agree this is a matter of opinion um, that an egalitarian society a more egalitarian society is a happier society from the bottom to the top so then we as journalists like we're not going to kind of spend time and spend space arguing for that we're just going to kind of cite to that research and go on ahead and do that in separate categories, or do you see it like a different way? I'm just curious about how you conceptualize it. Mm, I, I confess that I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, that's why I put on that slide, ask John. <laughs> so, um, I, I'd like to see people explore it, um, and I, I don't, I don't like the idea that something becomes the, um, I don't know, uh, the, the, the be all, end all encyclopedia of citations. Uh, I, I, I think the idea that people would, if they're pointing to the same stuff, then they can argue about and, and debate about the same thing. Whereas it, today we're, not necessarily doing that, and if it lives in a in a system where people um, can flag it for others, and where others can flag inconsistencies or outright mistakes and things of that sort, and just and um, it, I don't have a good analog to it. I think the talk page on Wikipedia on any robust Wikipedia article uh, gets at some of that, where people thrash out the article, which is bigger, obviously, in an annotation, but, but there's, a, there's a process of arriving at something that's, uh, in theory, neutral and valuable, and I think Wikipedia is one of the great achievements of our, of our age however flawed it is. My, my personal page there has been wrong for five years. And Jimmy's an old friend, and you know, he sort of laughs when I tell him that. He says, well, that's not my problem. But it's, I still think that's one of the great resources. And the fact that people can hash out the changes they want to do and cite, then go pointing to other things, that evidence layer ex put into Wikipedia would pre be pretty astounding too, where they, that would save them a lot of time. I'm, I'm, I do th I'm thinking of this, and I think John would agree, is adamant about this. this. This thing would be a great time saver for journalists who wanted to get stuff right. And that alone is valuable by you know, any standard. Again, I mean, you, when, I, when I'm in newsrooms these days, I realize how cushy my job used to be uh, and how hard they work and 
I want to tell you that the people doing journalism, especially local journalism, the young people, they are, they care more about journalism than my colleagues used to care because they're doing it under incredibly hard circumstances. So help them out. Standing there. Yeah, so just a quick follow-up to that. Do you see the evidence layer more as being uh, a group of resources um, or pieces of data that we've kind of acknowledged as being fairly robust? And then whatever analysis we make, whether we agree, whatever kind of determinations we make, we can just refer back to a piece of data that we do have trust in. Yeah, the, I think the key thing is we're, we're, we're referring to the same thing, that this is going to go, this is you know interoperable in the best kind of way for the people using it, and that at, at the very least we're having conversations and, and, and citations from the same item, and not just web pages and things, but uh, as the, the, the W3C spec of going deep into the you know, links that go to the, the fact level sentence level, things like that. This is, the potential for this is just huge. And it, it uh, one of John's expressions for this is to break down silos in a way that's never been done before. So I, I, that's one of the reasons I'm enamored of this, because I'm always in favor of breaking down silos as, as, a, as a rule. Sorry if I'm, I'm not giving you a good technical answer because I don't know. I completely understand and you're fully forgiven for that. <laughs> 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 <laughs>